It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Questions to the Premier. School starts in just a few weeks, and all we've seen from this Conservative government is chaos caused by the Premier's backroom deals. Radical extremists like Charles McVitie and Tanya Granick Allen want to prevent kids from learning about consent, cyberbullying, gender identity, and LGBTQ families. They want to drag Ontario back to 1998. I get that. That's who these people are. But this Premier is fulfilling their every wish, Speaker. Why does the Premier care more about satisfying social Conservatives than he does about protecting the health and safety of our students? Leader of the Opposition ran in the last election, went across the province like I did. Now, maybe we talked to two different groups of people, but I, I don't think so. Every single group I went to visit, Mr. Speaker, they told me they weren't consulted. We did a little research on how many people were consulted. There was 4,000 online surveys. Out of the 4,000, now keep in mind we're a province of 14 million, just want to remind people, out of the 4,000 people, Mr. Speaker, 1,638 people responded. And that was after the curriculum was done, by the way. That is 0.001% of the population. Response. Now, the Leader of the Opposition thinks that's fine to consult with 0.001% and then ram their liberal ideologies down the rest of the province. We believe in consulting with the people. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, scrapping the updated health curriculum puts students at risk. It is an irresponsible thing to do. And now the Conservatives are throwing school boards into limbo with just weeks before classes start. The Ontario Public School Boards Association has received no official notice from the Ministry of Education about what exactly is happening this fall and how exactly they're supposed to teach the 1998 curriculum in the year 2018. How does this Premier expect school boards to turn back the clock 20 years in less than six weeks? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I think the Leader of the Opposition is getting our numbers wrong. We're actually going back to the 2014 curriculum. <laughs> I, I know there might be a problem with numbers and figures, and I can appreciate that. But, but in, in saying that, we're going to go right across the province. We're going to contact 124 ridings, the constituents that live in those ridings. We're going to do a thorough end-to-end -end consultation that's never taken place ever before when it comes to the sex ed curriculum. We will go back to 2014 after we consult. I know the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe in consulting with the parents, but we will consult with the parents, we'll get their input, and from there we will move forward with a more modern sex ed, sex ed curriculum. Final supplement. Well, Speaker, maybe this Premier has trouble with what century we're living in, uh, but in fact, the 1998 curriculum is exactly the curriculum that he's dragging us back to, Speaker. They can pretend that it's 2014, but 2014, they were using the 1998 curriculum, right. Speaker. Premier's dragging us backwards, and his backroom deal with radical social conservatives is throwing school board planning into chaos. The Thames Valley School Board is seeking a legal opinion to figure out what could be the legal ramifications if teachers, in fact, do what's right for students and continue to teach the updated health curriculum this September. They want to know what kind of penalties will teachers face if they stand up and teach about consent, gender identity, LGBTQ families in their classrooms. So why is the Premier throwing these school boards into chaos and putting students' health at risk for no other reason, Speaker, for no other reason than to please the radical social conservatives in his own party? Response. 
Mr. Speaker, I find it ironic that the Leader of the Opposition is calling us radical. Yeah. That, that, that's a good one. That's the pot calling the kettle black. You just have to turn around and see your radicals. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition, as I've said over and over again, I know you don't believe I know you don't believe, Mr. Speaker, to consult with parents. They'd rather ram this through with 0.001% of the population, even understanding it. Our minister has been very clear. We've been very clear to all the ministries and schools right across all the school boards. We're going back to 2014 once we consult with the parents and we get their input because the Leader of the Opposition has no interest in consulting with parents. Spons. The Leader of the Opposition truly believes in the nanny state that they know better than the parents. We believe in consulting with the parents. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Here, my next question is also for the Premier. Uh, the Premier isn't just making backroom deals that put students at risk. He's also making backroom deals that will cost Ontarians more on their hydro bills. Yep. The Premier's decision to cook up a deal with the Board of Hydro One and give Mayo Schmidt at least $9 million is causing American regulators to sit up and take a second look at Hydro One's acquisition of Avista. And if regulatory deadlines are not met, Hydro One ratepayers could be required to pay a massive termination fee to a U.S. company, all because of the chaos caused by this Premier. When will the Premier come clean and tell us Radical. how much his backroom deal at Hydro One could cost the people of Ontario? Premier. Mr. Speaker, our party ran on reducing the hydro rates by 12 per cent. Our, our party ran on giving relief to business owners across this province, giving relief to the people of this province. Leader of the Opposition wanted to close down the Pickering Energy oh. Facility. Oh. Next month, if it was up to the Leader of the Opposition, there'd be 7,000 families yep. looking for a paycheck they wouldn't have. Yep. We believe in reducing the hydro rates. We promised we would get rid of the CEO of Hydro One, would replace the board, and that is exactly what we did. And we did it with zero severance. Members will take their seats. Please take your seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, gee, Speaker, talk about somebody who doesn't know how to deal with numbers. First, he said it was going to be a zero amount of money that this backroom deal was going to cost, and then we found out that his secret deal is actually going to turn the $6 million man into a $9 million great man, math. at least. Great. Well, that's great math, Speaker. And now the price tag continues to go up, and the people that are going to pay that price are ratepayers. You know, American regulators in four U.S. states are delaying regulatory hearings or reopening previous approvals, all because of the chaos and uncertainty being caused by this Premier. If regulatory deadlines are not met, Hydro One will be on the hook to pay $103 million to Avista, a dirty, coal-burning U.S. power company. Now, why would the Premier make a backroom deal that would cost Hydro One ratepayers, the people Question. of Ontario, over $100 million? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I think the Leader of the Opposition, she likes throwing figures around. We looked at her budget that was off by billions of dollars. So if you want to talk about numbers, we, we, we'll, we'll talk about numbers. But again, we promised to reduce the hydro rates by 12 per cent, and we're on track to putting money back into people's pockets and sending it down to pockets. We believe in making sure that Hydro One is run responsibly. We believe that the board members shouldn't be making $180,000 a year when people are struggling to pay their bills. They're struggling to put food on their table, but the Leader of the Opposition is okay with that. The Leader of the Opposition is okay with having the highest hydro bills in North America. 
She's okay with struggling families. She's okay with people getting their hydro cut off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members will take your seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, for 15 years under the Liberals, families and businesses watched their bills skyrocket, and new Democrats fought day in and day out to get them to turn back their position on the privatization of Hydro One. On the other hand, Conservatives had the privatization of Hydro One in their platform last time around. But you know what? Now, instead of fixing the problems in our hydro system, a chance that they have, the Premier is creating chaos and uncertainty that will only cost people more on their bills. He turned the $6 million man into a $9 million man, and Hydro One ratepayers could end up on the hook for $103 million if the Avista deal fails. Why did the Premier make a backroom deal that could cost the people of Ontario over $100 million and counting. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Last time I checked, the Leader of the Opposition was down here the previous four years, propping yep. the other administration up, propping Hydro One up, yep. propping wind turbines up that were paying 10 times the amount, yep. also propping up the folks that were actually selling, were selling hydro at a loss. At, at a loss. But again, the leader of the opposition is okay with that. She's okay with attacking yep. struggling families. That's what they did. She's okay with attacking businesses and driving them out of the province. They did. That's because they did. if it was up to the leader of the opposition, we would have wind turbines everywhere. Yep. We'd have even higher hydro costs. Yep. As one of her members said, they want the highest carbon tax anywhere in the world. Yeah. Anywhere in the world. Yeah. Leader of the opposition That's what they wanted with her. is anti-business. Yep. Anti-people that are struggling. Yep. You're anti-anti-anti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Next question, member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this morning, Violence Against Women advocates were at Queen's Park to release an open letter to the Minister of Education about the rollback of the 2015 sexual health curriculum. The letter was signed by 87 organizations and experts from across Ontario and across the country, and it highlights the serious consequences to women's safety when consent is no longer taught in our schools. Speaker, almost half of female high, high school students have experienced sexual harassment. One third have felt pressure into having unwanted sex. This year alone, 41 women and girls in, in Ontario were killed as a result of dating violence or intimate partner violence. Why is the Premier putting the health and safety of women and girls at risk by returning to a 1998 curriculum that provides no information about Thank consent you. and healthy relationships? Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. And if I may uh, pass on uh, to my dear friend, the member from uh, Toronto, Danforth, my condolences for what happened yesterday. Uh, earlier in the day, my husband and I have been in the Danforth, and uh, it really is regrettable and very tragic. Um, so I just I wanted to pass that on. I'd also like to thank the uh, member for her question. As the, women, as, as the member responsible for children and youth as well as women's issues, I welcome those in the gallery today that have come here to uh, discuss this issue, and I'd be happy to make myself available after question period to have a conversation with you. But let me be perfectly clear. We ran a 28-day campaign on talking about bringing back responsibility to parents and making sure that they were part of the curriculum. There's a big difference between being on that side of the house and making a promise and then breaking it and being on this side of the house and making a promise and keeping it. And that's what we're doing for the people of Ontario. Thank you. 
Speaker, people on the front lines of ending violence against women know that education on consent and healthy relationships is critical to prevent gender-based violence and advance gender equality. If this government was truly concerned about ending violence against women, they would ensure that students receive comprehensive, accurate information about consent, healthy relationships, and the right of girls and young women to say no. Why does this government care more about catering to a small group of social conservative insiders than about ending violence against women? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank the member again for her question, but let me be perfectly clear. The members on this side of the House, this government, will take violence against women very seriously, as well as gender-based uh, uh, violence, in, including uh, those who are being trafficked, and uh, that is going to be a very important component of our, of our government. But, uh, during the campaign, we made a very clear promise to replace the entirety of Ontario's sex ed curriculum with an age-appropriate one that is based on real consultation with parents. I get it. Previous NDP and previous Liberal uh, governments would come to this place, they would make promises, and then break them. But let me be perfectly clear, on this side of the House, when we make a promise, we keep it. Stop the clock. Members, will please take your seats. Please take your seat. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. For the past 15 years, health care services in Ontario have deteriorated under, under the previous government's administration. Statistics for May 2018 say that 9 out of 10 patients in Ontario spend on average 10.3 hours in emergency rooms, with some hospitals having ER wait times of over 20 hours. How short-sighted was the former Liberal government when they failed to plan for a long-term care strategy and have not created a single long-term care bed in 15 years? This oversight has resulted in immense backlogs in our acute care hospitals. Speaker, we have all heard of alternative level of care patients. These patients should be in long-term care beds, but are instead occupying acute care beds simply because there is nowhere else for them to go. Question. Speaker, can the minister tell us how our government for the people is going to fix the mess created by 15 years of neglect in Ontario's hospitals? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre for your question. The member is quite right that we are facing a health care crisis in this province, in large part driven by a long-term care crisis due to the long-term inaction of the previous government. We know that many hospitals across Ontario are consistently operating at over 100 per cent capacity, and that is simply unacceptable for both patients and our frontline health care workers who are trying to work with them. We also know that one of the ways to address hospital overcrowding is to enhance supports for patients outside the hospital. That's why our government has committed to adding 15,000 long-term care beds over five years and 30,000 long-term care beds over 10 years. Addressing the high alternate level of care rates through a focused long-term care strategy, reducing unnecessary emergency room Response. visits by providing better community supports, and finally introducing a comprehensive and connected mental health care system are just some of the ways our government is committed to fixing this mess and getting patients Thank you. Supplementary. The Speaker, back to the minister. The lack of long-term care strategy by the Liberals was not only fiscally irresponsible, but also created a domino effect of backlog, preventing many Ontarians from getting the proper medical attention they deserve. As an emergency room nurse myself, I spend many shifts in the back hall, taking care of five or six bedridden patients at a time. It was not only difficult to perform my nursing duties in this setting, but frankly demoralizing. Patients wait for hours or days in designated hallway beds to get proper treatment without dignity or privacy. Speaker, our healthcare professionals, nurses, doctors, and other hospital staff work in this environment, trying to help patients in hallways, which is impacting their own mental health and burnout rates. A hallway is not a place of work, and it question. definitely is not a place of healing. My question is simple. What will the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care do to put an end to hallway nursing in Ontario. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. The member is 
is right. I'm sure we could agree on all sides of this House that treating our loved ones in hallways and storage closets is not acceptable. And that's why our government has been clear. Ending hallway medicine is one of our key priorities, and we will deliver. Again, to start, our government has committed to building 15,000 long-term care beds over five years and 30,000 beds over 10 years, which will help alleviate some of the pressures. We've also committed to finally and fully developing a mental health and addiction strategy to give patients the ability to access supports outside the emergency room and before they are in crisis. And we will work with our frontline health care workers to improve access to primary care. Together, we will listen to patients and caregivers and to frontline workers, to doctors and nurses, to create a health care system Bonds. based on a comprehensive, long strategy for health care. Thank you. Next question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Concerns continue to grow around the hand-picked appointment of former PC Premier Gordon Campbell to audit the province finances. It's becoming very clear why Premier Ford has chosen Mr. Campbell. He cut and privatized services while selling off public assets, just like this Conservative government plans to do. Mr. Campbell's former chief of staff said of his appointment, and I quote, no matter what he says, I think it will be a fairly predictable outcome that he is ideologically aligned with the Ontario government, end of quote. Speaker, did the Premier appoint Mr. Campbell specifically because he will reinforce his own agenda of cuts and privatizations? Premier. Mr. Finan. Thank you for the question. Well, uh, our government has made a commitment to the people of Ontario to open up the books, to fully understand the province's fiscal position, restore accountability and public trust in our government's finances at long last. Uh, our government is carrying through with that promise with the appointment of former Premier uh, Gordon Campbell, who will uh, be joined by uh, Mr. Michael Horgan, longtime uh, federal public servant, and uh, Dr. Al Rosen, one of the preemptive, uh, preempt, uh, member, preeminent, um, thank you, uh, uh, forensic accountants in all of uh, the country. Uh, this is uh, uh, both a, uh, a commission of financial inquiry that's long uh, overdue and much needed in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Back to the Premier Speaker. Ontarians are very concerned about what Mr. Campbell's records of cuts will mean to our public health care system. The Ontario Health Coalition has condemned Mr. Campbell and his premiership, saying that he ranks, and I quote, among the very worst when it comes to its government actions on health care. Like Mr. Campbell's chief of staff, they are also worried that Mr. Campbell is a biased choice. With Mr. Campbell's record and the Premier promised to cut 4 per cent, our already underfunded health care system is at risk to be decimated by more cuts. Will the Premier commit today that he will not follow in Mr. Campbell's footsteps that he will not put more cuts to our health care system. Mr. Finance. Thank you. Well, uh, very disappointing, uh, yeah, disappointing, Speaker, to hear uh, a, a former Premier uh, of British Columbia, a Liberal Premier at that, being uh, uh, denigrated here in the legislature. He is joined by uh, preeminent uh, finan uh, financial. Uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Alan Rosen. He is being joined by a longtime public servant, uh, Michael Horgan, who not only served for 36 years uh, as a public servant, he served for five years as the Deputy uh, Minister of <clears throat> Finance for the federal government. And let's be clear, we need to understand that this Commission of Inquiry, the intention is to look back, Speaker, at what went wrong, Response. the uh, line by line uh, will look at ways to fix it. This is an opportunity to look at past spending and accounting practices. That is the role of this commission. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Member for York Centre. 
Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services and Minister Responsible for Citizenship and Immigration. I was following with great interest the meeting of Premiers in New Brunswick last week. One important issue on which the Premier is finding more partners on is illegal border crossing. As a former land immigrant myself, Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that Ontario is a welcoming province that generously helped to settle more immigrants than any other province in Canada. Ontarians know that our province is stronger with a diverse and robust immigration system. We are a, promise, a province of immigrants. That said, Ontarians want to know that there is integrity in the system and that our laws are respected. Speaker, my question is, could the Minister responsible for citizenship and immigration tell the House what she is doing to help bring back integrity to the immigration system? Thank you very much, Speaker, and to the member opposite. Uh, you really, truly are uh, somebody who is living the Canadian dream, born in the USSR, moving to Israel, and then coming to Canada, not only setting up a successful law firm and practice in the City of Toronto, but then becoming an MPP for York Centre. Congratulations. <laughs> you truly are an inspiration. And, uh, you know, we are a very welcoming society in Ontario, and I think that was evidence this past weekend when I was able to travel to uh, Junior Carnival in Scarborough with our colleague from uh, Scarborough Rouge River, as well as to the nation's capital where I reside, to, to attend events with the Indo-Canadian community, the Lebanese community, and the Ukrainian community. And let me be perfectly clear. Each event that I went to, talking to hundreds of people who were newcomers to this country, either as refugees or as immigrants, they told me they appreciated Premier Ford's strong leadership in ensuring that we have a strong and confident border system Thank and you. there's integrity in our immigration process. I'll speak more. Uh Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member will take your seat. Support our premier this past weekend. Finally. Lights off. Supplementary question. Speaker, back to the minister. I thank the minister for that answer and wonder if this government's call for integrity in the immigration system will be heard. Could the minister kindly inform the House as to what measures she intends to take to ensure that Ontario's voice is heard by the federal government? Minister. Thank you again for the question. Um, as you know, the, we have had some significant wins in the past couple of weeks under Premier Ford's leadership. Uh, first, we were able to ensure that the federal government understands that they have obligations with respect to resettlement and that they will fund directly the provinces. We're going to continue to make sure uh, that they, they fund us fully. We have about $175 million bill outstanding. We're going to continue to fight for that. Uh, the pr Prime Minister recognized the problems at the border, and within the week that we were uh, talking about this, it appointed somebody, uh, Bill Blair, to to become the minister responsible for border security, so I think that was significant. In addition, on Friday, I was very heartened to see that every premier in the, pro in the country stood by with our Premier Ford to ensure that uh, we send a very clear message to the federal government that they must pay their bills. And Tomorrow, I'll be going to Ottawa to appear before the Federal Immigration Committee, and I will tell them they need to pay their bills. We have $175 million and growing bill with the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier has said time and time again that he does not break the promises he makes. On May 29th, the Premier made a promise to the people of Fort Erie when he was asked if he would bring the slots back to the Fort Erie racetrack, and he said, and I quote, absolutely, we're going to get those back there. I sent the Premier a personal invitation to attend the Prince of Wales Stakes running in Fort Erie tomorrow. Will the Premier confirm today that he will be at the Prince of Wales Stakes tomorrow and that while he is there, he will be true to his word and return the slots to Fort Erie? Thank you. Mr. Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. You know, under the uh, previous Liberal government, the slots at Fort Erie Racetrack were indeed closed in April of 2012, putting approximately 220 people out of work. Wow. The slots there had operated for uh, 13, uh, 13 years. You know, Speaker, it is going to certainly take a tremendous amount of time to correct 
all of the errors of this previous Liberal government. It is going to take time, but we've already started, Speaker. We started by sca scrapping the cap and trade. We're saving families $285. We're working on lowering the price of gasoline by 10 cents a litre. Uh, we're getting out of the expensive energy contracts, saving $790 million along the way. Speaker, this is all about promises made and promises kept. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, I didn't hear a yes, so I want to ask the question again. As the Premier knows, hundreds of good-paying jobs were lost in Fort Erie when the Liberal government made a reckless decision to rip the slots out of the track. Revenue that supported the town were also lost. We have a chance here to do the right thing. I'll read that again. We have a chance here to do the right thing and get the slots back in Fort Erie and create good paying jobs. Given the Premier's promise to the people of Fort Erie, when can we expect to see the machines go back into the track? Promise made, so far, promise not kept. Speaker, I am absolutely shocked at the question from the uh, member of the opposition. Let's all remember it was the official opposition who helped pass the previous budget in 2012 that voted to cancel slots at racetrack. It was those people right on that side who made the vote. It was only the members sitting here, only these members, Speaker, who stood up against the Liberal government and voted against the budget that cancelled the slots at racetracks. The NDP government st stood with the Liberal government in 2012 uh, and, and shut down the horse racing speaker. I'm appalled to hear that. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Premier in his role as Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Ontario's trade relationship with the United States is a very significant factor in our strong economy. But I know that the Premier is aware that there are 28 states that count uh, Ontario as their number one or number two trading partner. So the integration of our economies really cannot be overstated. Um, over the last two years, Ontario has played a leading leading role in the Canadian uh, push to make, a, make a, an outreach to uh, governors. 38 governors have been contacted. There are relationships with auto sector uh, industry uh, organizations, agriculture industry organizations, Mr. Speaker. My question is, given the acceleration of the trade conflict between Canada and the U.S., how is the government going to build on those relationships to assist the federal government as part of a Team Canada approach to influence decisions? being made in Washington, because that outreach was done precisely for a moment like Thank this you. as the trade relationship deteriorated. And has the contact been made by the Thank you. Premier. Minister of Economic and Development Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the question. A very good question. Uh, yes, the Premier is uh, one of his uh, first actions or first actions uh, in becoming Premier. In fact, he was still Premier-elect. Uh, began to uh, contact uh, governors to, to build on the work, frankly, that the Honourable Member did when she was Premier of the province. Um, also, uh, Mr. Speaker, I just came back from, from Washington, where for the first time in the history of Ontario and, and U.S. relations, uh, I appeared before the uh, Commerce Committee uh, to speak directly to decision makers to make sure that they understand that uh, if President Trump were to bring in tariffs on automobiles and automobile parts, that yes, we would be devastated on this side of the border. Some 900,000 jobs, it's estimated, would pretty much go overnight, at least within the first 30 days. Uh, however, I reminded them and many of the governors and many of the lawmakers that we spoke to uh, did not know that some 9 million jobs would be lost. So if President Trump goes ahead, he's going to hurt us, but he's going to hurt his people a lot more. Supplementary. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I appreciate the minister's visit to Washington, but unless he's going to move there, we don't have a representative anymore in Washington, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has no representative in uh, Washington. Could the premier, through the minister, uh, update the legislature on plans to fill that position in order that, like Alberta and like Quebec, we have an effective presence in the U.S. You know, Mr. Speaker, issues like the Buy America provision in New York were pushed back to Ontario's advantage exactly because we had a representative in Washington, Mr. Speaker. So I'll ask the Premier when he will appoint a, a, a replacement, given the urgency of the trade issues facing this province, including the fact that NAFTA talks are set to resume within weeks. Minister of Economic Development, Job well, Creation. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. Um, we uh, not only were represented by uh, the uh, Deputy Ambassador of the United States, so Canada was represented, by very capable uh, bureaucrats at the bureaucratic level, but also by the Minister, Mr. Speaker. For the first time in our relationship with the United States, we didn't just send a bureaucrat to the hearings, we sent the Minister. And uh, we were really well received. Also, for the first time, 148 uh, members of Congress on the first day we were there wrote a letter, an unprecedented letter, to the president saying that it would not be right, it would be very harmful to U.S. citizens and to Ontario residents and our workers uh, if he put these tariffs on auto automobiles and auto parts. Response. So um, I think we made progress. I didn't get beat up over there, Mr. Speaker. That was a tree in my front yard. <laughs> we were well received, and uh, we were all rowing uh, on the oars in the same direction to tell people that Ontario is open for business, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members, will please take your seats. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Restart the clock. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Our government for the people wants to make sure that Ontario's economy thrives. Can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing speak to the changes announced to, to expedite development in downtown Toronto that will help create jobs? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, to thank the member for the question and also to congratulate her on her election. <laughs> I have all the faith in the world that she's going to represent the good people of Eglinton Lawrence in, a, in an, an exemplary fashion in this House. So thank you again. Our, uh, our government speaker uh, worked with the uh, City of Toronto and also with my colleague, uh, the Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry, to streamline approvals for new construction uh, on the, in the Lower Don. The changes will be felt, Speaker, not just in the City of Toronto, but it will have a huge impact in our province and in our country as well. Our government used uh, common sense and amended the, uh, the building code to enable construction to proceed in this strategic location in downtown Toronto at the same time that flood protection is underway. The approach will save us time, it will save us money, and it will protect health and safety at the same time. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Minister. This is great news for Toronto, for Ontario's economy, and for businesses. Could the minister tell the House how this announcement in Toronto fits into our government for the people's greater plan for creating a robust economy? Thanks, uh, thanks again to the member and speaker. I was uh, remiss in uh, not uh, congratulating you on your uh, selection as speaker. I look forward to, uh, to working with you, and I, I love seeing you in the chair. Um, you know, Speaker, uh, the people of Ontario gave us a very clear mandate to create jobs. We're doing that, and we're signaling that Ontario is open for business. Speaker, we're governing for the people, and in municipalities yeah. all across this province, municipalities are welcome. We're, we're smoothing the way for development in the Lower Dawn land by cutting red tape and working collaboratively with the City of Toronto and private developers. We're unlocking an employment potential of over 50,000 jobs, and over $5.1 billion will be added to the Canadian economy. 
we're doing more, we're going to be attracting uh, job creators in big cities and within municipalities. We're opening the door for businesses. I want to signal today that this announcement last week is just the first of many, many ways we're going to streamline development. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate you on your recent election as Speaker of this House. Today, my question is for the Premier. London's only family shelter, Rothholm Manor, operated by Mission Services, currently provides a temporary shelter for refugees and their families. Already this year, 80 refugees and 18 families have been assisted. But I was shocked to learn that as of last week, the shelter was at 219% capacity. City officials have recommended using federally and provincially owned properties as temporary shelters. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to providing these necessary shelters to the families at Rothholm Manor? Premier. Mr. Community and Social Services. Your children, much, Community uh, and Social Services. Premier, uh, thank you very much for your question. Your question signifies exactly what we have been trying to do for the past three weeks in making sure that the federal government helps support the province of Ontario and our municipalities because our shelters are at capacity. You don't have to take my word for it. The, pre the, the mayor of Toronto, who I spoke with on Saturday, is over capacity. We have invested 800 beds uh, from the province to the city of Toronto, but those are going to be required back on August the 9th. Therefore, we have a looming crisis that we've required. We've requested the federal government be involved in. In addition, the city that I reside in, the city of Ottawa, is an $11 million shortfall in its shelter costs. So this is happening right across Ontario, and it's happening because the federal government has lost control of its policies. And that's why I'll be there tomorrow in Ottawa, making sure that the federal government pays its bills for its responsibility, and they stop shirking the responsibility. It's time you stood up for Ontario. Thank you. Well, that answer is disappointing and does not deal with the need that we have in the shelters at this moment. London's not the only city that requires more government support to ensure that refugees and asylum seekers are properly housed. Yet this Conservative government chose to walk away from $11 million in federal funding for provincial refugee resettlement, downloading costs to already overwhelm municipalities. Mr. Speaker, Will the con Premier take concrete steps to provide support and housing and stop shifting the responsibility to other governments? Will they be opening the provincially and federally owned properties now? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, where in the world does $11 million equal $175 million? I think that's an irresponsible response from the member opposite. He should know that the federal government has sole jurisdiction over border management and Canada's refugee and asylum programs, including who is eligible for a refugee can't claim. Over $328 million comes from my department in social assistance for refugee claimants. We support them in many different ways, including with over $100 million in resettlement. What we are asking on this side of the House, and which Rachel Notley and Joe Horgan uh, have also, John Horgan, uh, agreed with, is to make sure that when the illegal border crossers come in and they are seeking asylum during that period of time, that the federal government pays its own way. So I ask you Boss. again, are you on the side of Ontario or are you on the side of Justin Trudeau? Stop the clock. The members will please take your seat. Restart the clock. Member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Since March 5th, more than 45,000 students at York University have been out of the classroom. They've been unable to attend classes because of the ongoing strike by two units of QP 3903. Mr. Speaker, I know our government has introduced the Back to Class Act to get these students back into the classroom so they can finish their courses that were halted over four months ago. 
Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain to the House why the government felt it was necessary to introduce the Back to Class Act? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate the member from Willowdale on getting elected. It is a question in the legislature today, and it is a very important question. Let me be clear, getting students back to the classroom is an immediate priority for us. This strike is the longest post-secondary strike in Canadian history. More than 45,000 students, including first-year students, affected by this strike. Understandably, the students are upset and concerned about losing their school year and uncertain about their future. Finding a resolution to this situation has to be done. We have every indication that both sides are deadlocked and there is no resolution in sight. Mr. Speaker, we need to get the students back to the classroom and to get the two parties back at the table. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. I agree there is a sense of urgency to get these students back into the classroom, and I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. You know, during second reading debate on Thursday, I, along with many of our colleagues, shared with the House the experiences of students who have been affected by this very unfortunate strike. Mr. Speaker, the government promised to put an end to the strike at York University by two units of QP Local 3903. Can the minister please elaborate for the members of this House why it's appropriate to move forward with this legislation? Minister. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, again, I'd like to thank the member uh, for the very important question. Uh, the students at York University have been out of the classroom for more than four months. It's over 100 days. Enough. Faculty members of Unit No. 2 of QP 3903 have already settled. The remaining two parties are deadlocked. There seems to be no solution in sight. This was confirmed by an independent industrial inquiry commission. So, Mr. Speaker, our priority is clear. We need to get the students back to the classroom, get the two parties back to the table. This is about getting the over 45,000 students affected by this group back, strike back to the classroom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. President Donald Trump's threat to impose tariffs on auto and auto part imports would be devastating to Ontario's auto sector. It would put thousands of good jobs at risk in Oshawa and across Ontario. In the past, Conservatives have said that they would be content to see auto Ontario's auto sector die. Speaker, there wasn't a single mention of auto manufacturing in the PC Party platform. What the PC Party did promise was to kill the Jobs and Prosperity Fund, which supports millions of dollars of investment into the sector. So, Speaker, will this Conservative government develop a comprehensive auto manufacturing strategy for Ontario? Premier. Mr. of Economic and Development Affairs. Minister of Economic Development. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for, uh, for the question. I know the NDP have asked this of the uh, former government on many occasions, so uh, I have directed the, part, the department to uh, begin work on a current plan of uh, auto strategy. Um, it's a personal interest to me. I have Honda Manufacturing of Canada in my riding. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, the Honourable Member is quite correct. Uh, we're extremely dependent on the automotive sector, the automotive parts sector, automotive servicing sector. Uh, one in five jobs, or 1.3 million Ontarians, uh, work in that sector. And uh, the ripple effect is uh, millions more people. Their jobs are dependent both on this side of the border and uh, on the American side of the border and uh, in New Mexico. And that's why I was down in the United States last week to remind them just how important the sector is. A lot of our governors and that don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to Canada, but in this time of trade crisis, Spons. they're starting to pay attention and we're bringing the facts to their, to their attention so that they'll know that millions of their people will be affected should the president do what he, th what he wants to do. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Premier. For years, the auto and auto parts industry have been calling on the Government of Ontario to develop a real and meaningful auto manufacturing strategy for the province. But to this day, Ontario has no strategic plan for an industry that accounts for one-fifth or 20 percent of our GDP. So this is beyond irresponsible and does put the entire Ontario economy at risk. 
Speaker, we cannot predict what President Trump will do, but we can prepare for any outcome. So will this government do the responsible thing and work with the auto and auto parts sector to develop a real auto manufacturing strategy? Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the honourable member. I find it ironic. In the 28 years I've served here, it seemed to me the NDP were against economic development. You want $2 a litre gas, you want higher, high, higher uh, high, hydro rates, uh, cap and trade. You were doing everything you possibly could as a party to kill the auto sector in this province. So we'll, we'll do what you failed to do and what the Liberals failed to do. And we'll lower prices, we'll lower gasoline, we'll lower hydro, we'll make this place competitive again. Ontario is open for business, and that includes our auto sector, a sector you ignored for years. Members will take their seats. Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, restart the clock. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. There is a health care crisis in Ontario, and addressing this crisis starts by ending hallway medicine and alleviating the backlogs in our hospitals. But there is a silent killer among the health care crisis too long. That is lack of mental health supports. The cell phone was going off, so I'll ask the member to, to restart his question. Killer amidst the health care crisis, and it has been ignored for far too long. That is lack of mental health supports. Approximately 20% of individuals will directly experience a mental illness during their lifetime. Approximately 80% of individuals will be directly affected by mental illness among family members, friends, or colleagues. Mood disorders, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, personality disorders, eating disorders, and so on, have a devastating effect on the lives of Ontarians and on their family members. Will the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care lay out what this government is doing for those that are struggling with mental health issues? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for this important question. We have been very clear on this issue throughout the election campaign and now as a government. We will support Ontario's public health care system by adding $3.8 billion to create a comprehensive <laughs> mental health, addiction, and housing strategy. That's $1.9 billion provincially to match the $1.9 billion to be committed by the federal government. Developing and implementing a thorough, comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction strategy once and for all as a priority for us. As we all know, mental health is health. With increases to mental health funding, families, especially with children and youth with mental health issues, no longer have to wait for the life-saving services they need. They will receive these services where they need them and when they need them. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer and for moving swiftly to address this issue. In follow-up, it is a people like our frontline health care workers that we must fight for and support during our time in government. These frontline health workers are the heroes in our hospitals and health care centres that help Ontarians through difficult times such as mental illness. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, how will you support our frontline health workers in Ontario hospitals and care centres and ensure we're listening to them? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I thank the member for the question. As Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, I look forward to working with our frontline workers in mental health care in places like Ontario Shores Centre for, for Mental Health Sciences, Children's Mental Health Ontario, and KMH. The government will supply the frontline workers with the resources they need to support and serve Ontario's patients and families so that we can all move forward to create a mental health and addiction strategy for Ontario that all Ontarians can navigate. As the Premier has said in the past, the Ontario PC government will provide faster access to care by enhancing access to primary care providers, reducing unnecessary emergency room visits, and bringing down wait times. Promise made, promise yeah. kept. Yeah. Stop the clock. Members, 
Council, please take your seats. Restart the clock. Member for Timiskaman Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2012, the Liberal government cancelled the Northlander passenger train, the only passenger rail link to northeastern Ontario, stranding uh, thousands of Northerners. During the campaign, the Premier promised to bring passenger rail back. Northerners listened intently to the throne speech, and we didn't hear much about Northern Ontario, but we didn't hear anything about passenger rail in the bring back passenger rail northeast. There was no mention. So, has the Premier forgotten his promise? And if not, when will passenger rail come back to northeastern Ontario? Mr. Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have a tremendous opportunity across this vast region of Northern Ontario to open up corridors, Mr. Speaker, so people can move about from health care facilities in small towns to bigger city centres, to move mineral product, Mr. Speaker, to move forestry products, to open Northern Ontario up for business and contribute to that advantage that our, our Premier said throughout the campaign. The, the hope and prosperity for Ontario, Mr. Speaker, that we would all be open for business, including Northern Ontario. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Through you, Speaker, during the campaign, the Premier promised to bring back passenger rail to northeastern Ontario. Let me make that clear. Passenger rail, the Northlander passenger train. We know all about freight, we know all about, but we also have to move people. What I heard in that response, what I heard in that response is promise made, promise maybe. That's what I heard. <laughs> Northerners want to work together to bring that rail back. When will you make that promise? And when will that train come back? Well, I'll be a chicken fried and goose fat, Mr. Speaker. That's a member who voted to shut that corridor down and shut that rail service down. We want to, we want to move people. We want to move product. We want Northern Ontarians to be able to move across our vast region, very much including Northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. When, when the Premier says we're open for business, he means the great region of Northern Ontario as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Flam Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Last week, the government, for the people, announced plans to restore trust and accountability to public finances. After 15 years of liberal waste, mismanagement, and scandal, this is badly needed. In fact, the Toronto Sun editorialized that the Commission of Inquiry into the State of Ontario's finances and the line-by-line -line audit of government spending ordered by Premier Ford as he promised in the election, are critical first steps. It is important for the public to understand why we need these two separate but connected endeavours to do this. Through the Speaker to the Minister, can you explain to the House what exactly the Commission of Inquiry will be responsible for and how it is different from the line-by-line -line audit? Great question. Minister Clare. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, for the question from the member uh, of Flamborough-Glanbrook. Uh, it's great to see you here. The, <clears throat> the Commission of Inquiry will look back at what went wrong, while the line-by-line -line audit will look at ways to fix this. The Commission, headed up by former British Columbia Premier Gordon Campbell, will look at the from, uh, the province's past spending and accounting practices. That's the, that's the real crux of this speaker, is looking at the practices. Their job is to help to bring us to the present, to determine what the state is of Ontario's finances today. The Commission will report back by August 30th, and the public will see the same report that the Premier and the rest of us see. And as we highlighted last week, the Auditor General welcomes this and has Spons. said that she stands ready to assist. Speaker, the Treasury Board President will address the line by line. Supplementary. 
Thank you for that response, Minister. The previous Liberal government has left our public finances in a very challenging position. Ontario has the highest subnational debt of any jurisdiction in the world. It took 15 years for the previous government to create this mess, and it won't be solved overnight. Yeah. It is clear that the Commission, working closely with the Ministry of Finance, will shed light on the accounting practices that led our economy into some of the challenges that we now face. Mr. Speaker, would the President of the Treasury Board please update the House on the further steps the government is taking to ensure the people of Ontario not only have a true picture of the province's finances, but also a clear understanding of this urgent and complex issue. Minister. President of Treasury Board. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member for uh, Flamborough Glenbrook. And I also would like to commend you on your great victory. So, congratulations. As one of our first priorities, this government announced last week, as the Minister of Finance and the Premier have mentioned, that we will commission a line-by-line -line audit of the province's finance, and the Treasury Board Secretariat is currently seeking bids from outside consultants. A firm will be selected in a few weeks. Mr. Speaker, under this government, Ontario's finances will be healthy and honest once again. All, program all provincial programs, agencies and transfer payments are within the scope of this audit. The results will be used to develop a responsible plan to achieve efficiencies for taxpayers. Once. Mr. Speaker, we will not tire and we will not stop until we have uncovered all of the waste of the previous government. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The sudden cancellation of the Green Ontario Fund has hurt families in my riding who had signed contracts worth several thousand dollars. In Wawa, where families face some of the highest energy costs in the province, 30 homeowners were approved to receive a rebate for installing new modern wood heating appliances, but they have until September to finish the installation. This is, this is not enough time. Many families will lose the rebate and many contractors will lose the work. Will the Premier take thousands of dollars out of the pockets of Northern Ontario families or will they extend the Green Ontario program? Minister of the Environment. Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, through you, the member, and thank you for the question. We've been very clear and very honest with the people of Ontario. Yeah. We campaigned on the promise to end the Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax program, and we will do just that. We're proceeding with the orderly wind-down of the program, and we have proceeded with that because it is funded by the regressive tax that the previous government had put into place. We've made clear to all the participants in the program the timings for that, and we will not change our mind. We will not deviate from that schedule because it's important, Mr. Speaker, that the people of Ontario know. We are not in favour of a carbon tax cap-and-trade program. We will not support the programs by that, but we will wind them down on an orderly basis to support the businesses that, in good faith, worked with that program. Here, here, here. Again, to the Premier, a constituent of mine, Roly Dubois, the owner of Dubois Construction, is one of the many who are suffering from the unexpected cancellation of the Green On program. Mr. Dubois did everything he was supposed to do. He invested in his employees and sent them for training and to qualify under the Green On program. He paid the mileage, the accommodations, the tuition and wages while they got the training. But now, because of the Premier's cancellation of the Green On program, the work will disappear and he and his workers will have invested that time and money for nothing. Will the Premier continue to ignore people like Roly Dubois or will he respect businesses and their workers and extend the Green On program so all installations can be completed? Response. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Um, we campaigned quite clearly. We were honest with Ontarians. We would be eliminating the cap-and-trade carbon tax program and the programs funded with it. Your constituent and other constituents would suffer much more under the NDP's version of a carbon tax, here, here. the highest carbon tax in the world, than they will from the straightforward approach of this government. We will not support the carbon tax. Here, here, here.
That concludes the time for question period. Before we adjourn for the morning, I want to introduce a guest who I have in the visitors' gallery, actually the speakers' gallery. My executive assistant, Judy Brownrigg, who has worked in my constituency office for 28 consecutive years. <laughs> and there being no deferred votes, this House is now recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.